I've never really told anyone about the story, with very few exceptions. Basically, I've only mentioned it to two people. One I married, and one that isn't really in my life anymore. It didn't really matter when I mentioned it to them, mostly because it was several years after the fact, and they didn't really seem to be interested in it when I told them about it, which probably speaks to why they aren't in my life anymore. That said, I was listening to a few YouTube narrators tell creepy encounter stories, and I realized that I could go ahead and tell my story to the internet, and maybe someone there would care. And maybe I'm overreacting with the whole thing, but it was just one of those situations that seriously freaked me out when I was younger, and still kind of makes me sick to my stomach when I think about it now. I was young when this happened, like 14 or 15. Now, to tell you a bit more about who I was and how my life was back then, when I was around 6, I ended up in the foster system and had been cycled through a couple of families for various reasons. One of the things that you're not really told about the foster system that you have to be a part of it to realize, there are people that adopt kids for money. It is absolutely a thing that happens, and when it does, the kids usually don't live their best lives. I was one of those kids. My foster parents had four other adoptees that they pretty much just ignored, and they collected a check each month from the government. Because of this, I was pretty much left to my own devices from the time I was six to the time I was 16. After that, I had actually moved out of the foster home and in with a friend of mine whom I actually ended up marrying. Being left to do whatever I wanted most of my life led me to doing things I shouldn't have. I'm not going to beat around the bush. When I was 14 or so, I had done a few different drugs and I was already drinking pretty frequently with people I should not have been hanging out with. I honestly don't even remember how I ended up with the crowd that I did, but I would frequently go out after school on Fridays and hang out with people that were older than me. I would drink with them until I would black out or until I couldn't feel anything. Surprisingly, none of them ever did anything to me. I was 14 and very vulnerable, and seeing as how I would black out at the house with four or five guys that were anywhere between 17 and 24, they easily could have sexually assaulted me, but none of them even tried to hit on me. I think they looked at me as a younger sister, not enough to try and steer me on the right path, but enough that none of them looked at me like that. That said, this specific event and situation was one where I wish I would have just drank until I blacked out and slept it off over there, but I didn't. Now, for the most part, I would get to the point where I would have zero memory of the night before, but on this night, I wasn't feeling it and only drank enough to be numb. I was still mostly conscious and able to focus. Because of this, I decided that around 1.30 in the morning, I would walk from their house to home, which wasn't too far, but it was definitely far enough that a drunk 14-year-old girl should not have been walking it, especially considering it was January and somewhere in the neighborhood of zero degrees Fahrenheit. But brave, stupid, little old me was completely invincible and wanted to go home, so I could sneak in and sleep in my own warm bed. I have no idea why I wanted to do that. I would have been warm and safe there. I just know I wanted to. The walk home started simple enough. I told them I was leaving, walked out into the snow-covered yard, and tried to keep my footing on the frozen sidewalk. About 300 feet away from the house, I started thinking that this was stupid and that I was going to freeze to death. Or fall and break something but I was also a dumb kid and decided to just buck it up and go the whole way now I wasn't exactly bundled up for snow but thankfully it had stopped and at this point I just had to deal with the wind and freezing cold I had a coat sure but I was also wearing shorts 
which was something I was definitely regretting pretty quickly. Despite these complaints, I was determined, and after about half an hour, I was at the home stretch. I could see my front yard from the corner I was at, and I would be there in somewhere close to five or ten minutes. As soon as I took the turn onto my street, I heard that sound of a front door and screen door opening and then closing just to my left. I didn't think much of it at first, but then I heard someone yell, Hey! in my direction. I wanted to ignore it, but my inebriated brain told me to look over and see who was calling for me, which was dumb because I didn't know any of the people on the street, with the exception of our direct neighbors. I glanced over to see who it was, and my stare was met with an older man, probably somewhere in his 60s, standing in his yard with his hands on his hips, and literally no clothes on. When I say no clothes, I mean nothing. No underwear, no robe, no socks, no shoes, not even a hat or anything. He was hanging out in all the glory of the day he was born. As soon as I made eye contact, his angered face quickly turned to a devious smile, and he said, Why are you out here so late, sweetheart? I turned back to look ahead so as to not be staring at this naked dude surrounded by snow, and just said, I'm just walking home, sorry to bother you. Which was probably just the response that came from my dumb drunk brain. He then starts to walk towards me from his front door and says something like, why don't you come on in? It's cold out here. To which that same drunk brain decided to be a smartass and I say, yeah, I can tell. As soon as I made my snide quip, this dude started yelling obscenities at me as loud as he could and started to speed up in my direction. As soon as I heard him running towards me, I took off in a sprint towards my house. I turned back and saw that he was following me as fast as he could. Thankfully, I was about 50 years younger and probably close to 200 pounds lighter at the time, so I was able to get a bit of a lead. Unfortunately, around the point where I hit my yard, I realized two things. It was 1.30 in the morning, no one in my house was awake, and I didn't have a key to the front door. My original plan of sneaking in wouldn't have worked as it was, and at this point, I was stuck with having to break in, but that wasn't going to work since I had the naked old man seriously tailing me into my own yard. The only thing I was going to be able to do was get into my backyard and hope that the outside door to the detached garage was unlocked, and then hope that he would eventually give up on his chase. I got to my yard and hopped the wooden fence and immediately was hopeful that would be enough to stop him. Almost as if he read my mind, he literally shouted out, Oh, you're going to make me work for you, huh? The tone of his voice seriously sickened me, and just replaying it in my head makes me get those same chills down my spine. I took off around the house and got to the rear garage door, and almost as if God himself responded to my panicked request, I grabbed the knob and turned. I literally leaped into the garage and shut the door behind me, then locked it. I was sitting there on the ground with my back against the door, freaking out and thinking that this guy was seriously going to get me, that he was going to break the glass on the door and open it, then abduct me. I heard him huffing and shouting at me, saying things like how he only needed me for a couple minutes, and how he promised it wouldn't hurt too much. This guy was seriously a predator, and he was hunting me. I heard him walking around the backyard, I heard him put his hands on the garage doorknob and try it, then I heard him yell and walk away. I would have to guess that he didn't realize I was in there because he kept walking around and calling out for me. I want to reiterate that this naked old man had run after me in the snow, climbed over a fence into my home's backyard, and was still yelling out for me. He obviously had no shame and no care about whether or not someone saw him or noticed him. He had a one-track mind, and getting to me was that track. At some point in time, 
My brain gave up and my drunk self started to doze off, sitting on the floor of the garage. I was freezing cold, drunk and scared, but I was also exhausted and I ended up just falling asleep right there against the door. My guess is when he realized I wasn't outside anymore or wasn't in a place he could get to, he gave up and went back home. Mostly because when I woke up, it was to one of my older brothers opening the garage door to leave for work. He basically just told me to go inside and go to bed, which I did, mostly because I knew that the hangover was going to suck. This was seriously the most terrifying thing to have ever happened to me. The fact that this old, naked man was willing to run out into the freezing weather, chase me down the street, and enter into my backyard to get to me, then yell while outside my home about what he was going to do to me was... Well, it was horrifying. It's even worse that either no one in my family woke up to it or cared enough to see what the hell was going on. Like I said, I'm much older now, pushing into my late 40s, and am married to someone that does actually love me. It just pains me and sickens me to know what he was probably looking to do to me, and I'm thankful for the fact that I was able to get away from him. But I also worry with how brazen he was about everything, I'm thinking I may not have been the first person he targeted. I have a story I wanted to share from about 10 years ago that was one of the most terrifying things to happen to me. It's a rough story to tell because at the end of it all, I was pretty messed up both physically and mentally. I don't want to give out too much information about where I live or where this happened for obvious reasons, but I will say it was in the Midwest, and where I live, we get some pretty serious winters. By that, I mean a lot of snow, a lot of accumulation, and a lot of the time the ground freezes over pretty bad. For the most part, the main cities are well taken care of, and they treat the roads, but when you get in between cities or suburbs, it's kind of a, we wish you the best of luck, hope you don't die situation. And I nearly did die, so their well wishes of luck didn't do much for me. As mentioned, this was about 10 years ago. I think it was the winter of 2011 into 2012, and what happened was in late December. I know this because I was actually driving home from my parents' house after having spent Christmas with them. It had become a bit of a tradition as I got older and moved away from home that I would spend at least a few days around the week of Christmas with them, and I've always been close to my parents, so I didn't really want to let them down. This year in particular, the weather getting there was fine, but the day before I was set to head home, the news had mentioned that we were going to get hit with a decent amount of freezing rain, followed by snow. If you don't live in an area where you get freezing rain snow mixes, let me tell you it can be hell to go anywhere. That rain leaves a really nice layer of ice on the road, and then the snow just makes it that much more lovely. Seeing as how I had to drive about three hours to get from my parents' house to my home, I was watching the weather forecast pretty closely. Based on the forecast, if I left at 8 in the morning, I would be able to get most of the way home before the storm hit the area. So I made plans on that. Of course, my dad tried to convince me to wait it out and stay a couple of days longer, just in case. But I had to get back to work, and being that I was around 30 at this time, I kind of assumed that my plan would work, and that, so long as I stuck with it, I would be fine. So the next morning, I got all my stuff together, got a shower in, and I spent about half an hour having coffee with my parents before I hit the road. I actually got out about 15 minutes before 8, and was even more convinced that I would be fine, and that I would beat the wintry mix that was expected to completely cover the area. 
And of course, the only way to describe my hubris was sorely mistaken. I got out on the road, drove for about half an hour, and almost at exactly the 45-minute mark, I noticed small raindrops hitting my windshield. Of course, at this point, I had reached the outside of the city that my parents lived in, which meant that, for the most of the trip, the roads were not going to be treated at all. I was nervous, but kept telling myself that, so long as I kept the car going at a steady pace, I would make it before things got too bad. Plus, the odds of it getting really bad ahead of me were slim, right? I could totally beat the brunt of the storm. Yeah, I was way wrong. Within a few minutes of the rain starting, it hit a point where I could barely see in front of me. It was coming down so hard. I could tell that the road was starting to get slick in spots, so I slowed down some, but was still confident that if I just pushed on for a little while longer, I would be in the clear. Then after driving in the rain for probably close to 15 minutes, the flurry started, and they were massive chunks of snow that covered everything in a matter of minutes. By this point, I was actually getting nervous. The ground and the roads were starting to be covered, there were spots of ice everywhere, and the conditions were nowhere near ideal. The problem was, by then, I was about an hour and ten minutes into the drive home. Neither continuing on the road nor turning back really seemed like a good idea. If I kept going, I could at least get most of the way there or get through some of it and get home eventually, but turning back would be driving straight into where the storm was already hitting, and that would be even more dangerous. I really didn't know what to do. Part of me wanted to just pull over where I was and see how bad it got, but if we were going to be covered in what was essentially an ice storm, then parking and waiting could have been honestly a death sentence. I was in a bit of a state of panic, so I decided I would call my parents' home phone and have them on speakerphone while I drove at a slow but steady pace down the road. My dad answered, and I immediately told him that he was right, that I should have just stayed there for an extra day or two. He told me to turn around, and I told him that I was already almost half of the way out, and turning around wouldn't work. We talked for a bit about how things were looking. He told me that the forecast had pretty much changed to don't go out unless it's life or death, which didn't help my anxiety. I just told him that I wanted to keep them on the phone for a while, just in case things went wrong. He agreed and then started telling me about just random things that he was going to have to do around the house and how much he was looking forward to having to shovel the driveway tomorrow. After about 10 minutes of this, I heard him say, "Uh uh-oh. I asked what was wrong and he mentioned that the power had flickered and that he may lose me. I, of course, had called their home phone because it was the speed dial I had set on my phone. He then started saying that if they lost power, I should call them back on his cell phone, and as soon as he said that, the line cut out. I cursed my luck and then did something beyond astronomically stupid. I looked down and reached to grab my phone so I could call him back. As soon as I looked back up from the cup holder, which couldn't have been for more than half a second, my eyes met the road and saw the thing that messed me up psychologically. I saw a child in the road. I have to say that I am 100% certain that what I saw was a small child wandering out into the road. They had on a dark coat with a fur hood. They had long curly red hair which made me think it was a little girl, and she was wearing what looked like a long, dark dress that kind of puffed outward near the bottom. I can replay this imagery in my head without fail every single time I think about it. I have no idea why there was a child walking into the road, especially out here between cities, in what was basically the middle of nowhere, but I'm certain there was. Of course, my instincts kicked in, and I slammed my brakes, which was also rather stupid of me. As soon as my brakes kicked in, my tires slid on the ice, 
and my car took a hard turn into the left and started to fishtail. Because I panicked and didn't correct my maneuvers, I ended up flipping my car multiple times onto the side of the road and was nothing shy of lucky that I didn't smash into a tree or end up upside down. Thankfully, the car landed upright, and while I did black out for a few seconds, I eventually did get through the shock and was able to focus on things. My head was damn near hitting the roof of the car with how much it had been crushed down. The windows were all shattered. I could feel the blood on my face. I could tell that I was messed up, but I knew that I needed to get my phone if I was going to live. Otherwise, there was a good chance that I would freeze to death. Thankfully, I was able to reach my phone and hit the button to call my dad's cell phone. As soon as he answered, I cut off his cheerful greeting with, Call 911. I flipped my car and I'm bleeding. He told my mom to call 911 on her phone and he kept me on, talking to me and making sure I didn't pass out. It was a bit of a struggle trying to tell him where exactly I was, but the medical crew was able to figure it all out and they got the ambulance to me within a fairly reasonable amount of time, especially considering how bad it was out there. By the time they got me out of my car and to the hospital, I was barely awake. I had lost a lot of blood, and I was certain that I was going to be in a lot of pain the moment the adrenaline wore off. By the end of it, I had a broken leg, a cracked pelvis, a fractured orbital socket from where I smacked my head on my window, which I don't even remember. I had multiple contusions on my head and all over my body, multiple cuts on my face, and definitely had a fairly major concussion. So the fact that I was able to get my phone and get the call out to my dad was pretty much a miracle. Of course, when I told EMS that there was a child out in the woods that walked onto the road, they had to report it to the police so they could do a search. A child wouldn't live long in that storm, so they had to be sure there wasn't. They never found a little girl, and I was basically told that it was probably a deer or something like that, and I misremembered because of my head injury. I can tell you right now that it was not a deer. I know what a deer looks like, and my memory up to the accident is crystal clear. It was definitely a little girl. Though at this point, I don't think she was a living little girl. Part of me thinks this was some kind of spirit that was trying to kill me, and nearly succeeded. So that's the story of the time I nearly died in the middle of a winter storm in the middle of nowhere. Ever since then, if there's even a hint of snow, I will stay and wait it out, because I'm convinced that that little girl is some kind of demonic spirit out there just waiting for it to snow so that they can walk out into the road and potentially lure motorists to their death. When I was younger, I seemed to get sick a lot. If someone around me was ill, I would always catch it. A lot of different foods also seemed to make me sick, to the point that I would curl up in a ball and sleep. My parents would later have tests done to find out what could be wrong with me, but I bring this up to explain the situation further. My parents weren't neglecting me because it was a normal occurrence for me, and I would just wait for it to pass. Not to mention, I was old enough at this point to stay home by myself. One night in January, after dinner, I started feeling nauseous, so I took my medication and went to lay down on the couch. My little sister wanted to spend her Christmas and birthday money, her birthday is December 30th, but didn't want to wait any longer. I told my parents they could take her and I would stay home and sleep. I wanted to be left alone anyways, so I didn't have a problem with it either. They finally agreed after convincing them I would be fine and reminded my mom of the return she needed to make as well, and they left around 5 or 6 p.m. It wasn't quite dark yet, so they had said that they would call when they were close to home so I could turn on the porch light. 
now with them gone, I laid on the couch, turning the TV on something to fall asleep to, and slowly drifted off. It had been an hour or so when I was startled awake by something on the TV. I grabbed the remote to turn it down, and as I readjusted on the couch, I looked over to the large window in the living room and noticed it was dark. Then I noticed there seemed to be a figure in the window as well. I wore glasses and didn't have them on at the time, so I thought I just wasn't seeing something right. So I just stared at the figure for the longest time, trying to focus and get my brain to figure out what I was looking at. After a few, I leaned over to the table and put on my glasses, and that's when I started to realize it was definitely a person staring back at me. I could see the outline of a hood, their shoulders, and their arms. Then I started thinking, what the hell do I do? This person is staring back at me and knows what I look like. Will they try to rush in at me if I try something? I slowly started to lay back down on the couch like I didn't notice and grab my phone with my eyes closed. I guess I thought I was being sneaky and making it look like I wasn't going to call 911, but that was when the window was smashed in. I just remembered screaming and running to my parents' bedroom which was in the far back side of the house. I wanted to get as far away as possible, and since it was on the bottom floor, it had a window I could possibly go through. I ran back there, immediately locked the door, and called 911. My parents' room had a big walk-in closet, and the operator told me to hide in there until I heard the police show up. I was scared and had a million things going through my mind. You always think you know what you would do in these situations until they happen and then you hope the operator can save you and tell you everything you need to do to survive. I also wanted to call my parents and the operator was actually awesome enough to have someone call them somehow which was also a relief. Like I said it was already dark so it had been a few hours so I would expect that they would be home soon. It felt like forever, but after checking the call records, it had only been about seven minutes, I think, before I heard the cops calling out, and I hung up and came out to them. When I walked out, one met me at my parents' door, and there were two more in the living room. It was freezing in there with the window, of course, but my attention was averted when the officer showed me this rock with what looked like a paper and tape on it. I asked them if it was a note, and they said yes, and asked if there was anyone they could think of that would want to hurt me or my family, and I had no clue. My mom was a nurse, and my dad did construction, not like they could really have enemies, and then my sister and I were still in school. Last I checked, we didn't have people that hated us to this level. Thankfully, my parents showed up soon after, and I didn't want to let go of my dad. They asked them the same thing, and then showed us the note. It said something like, next time, it won't be your window, time to pay up. The cop asked us if we knew someone that would do this again, or if any of us owed someone, and we all said no. My dad had to get the window boarded up, and our neighbor came over and helped. Because of this happening and not being able to get the window fixed that week, my dad went and bought some security cameras and had one pointed at the door and window, both back and front doors, and the driveway. He also wouldn't let me stay home by myself anymore. I felt safer with the cameras because we got alerted when someone approached the areas, but I didn't like staying home at night by myself anyways. Now, it's been about two weeks or so since this had happened, and the window has since been fixed. It was one evening I had gone to my room to just chill when I got an alert on the camera. Most of the time I ignored them, unless it was one at the front door, and this one happened to be there. So I tapped on it, and there was a guy that walked up to the door, put something under the rug, and took off. I was about to go check on it when I started hearing my parents shouting, I went to the living room and saw my mom standing at the door on the phone 
and my dad is down the driveway. I finally learned what all happened when my mom showed me the envelope. It had a letter in it that said, sorry about the window, with a $100 bill in it. My dad had seen the alert as well and tried to chase the guy, but he got away. They called the cops to report it and showed them the video where the guy wasn't even trying to hide his face. It wasn't long after that that they found and caught the guy. Apparently, he felt bad and decided to try and pay for the window. I recently learned from my parents that the guy that broke our window knew our neighbor and was probably trying to break hers, but that's just old people gossip that I haven't been able to confirm. Either way, it was a terrifying situation for my teenage self, and now I don't like sleeping in the living room unless the curtains are completely closed. And if it's going to be dark soon, just turn on the porch lights and make sure your doors are locked. So, I have a creepy story that happened back when I used to do snow removal for a bunch of rental properties. So, back around 2010. For a slight bit of backstory, I worked for a small company that did contract work for the aforementioned rentals. They would load us up, two or three in a pickup truck, we would go out to the properties while it was snowing, or just after a snowstorm, and it would be our job to plow out the parking lots, shovel the main stretch of sidewalk, drop some ice melt, and make sure everything was good to go for the residents by the time they got up to go to work. We weren't exactly detail-oriented. We were pretty much just told to move the snow out of the way and make sure that no one would slip, fall, or otherwise hurt themselves on the common areas. It was probably one of the most strenuous jobs a person could possibly do. Wake up at 3 a.m., load up into the truck, get to the sites, start shoveling. That last part was my main duty. I didn't get to drive the truck. I was the newbie that was told to run the shovels on the sidewalks and drop the ice melt. It was miserable, but it paid all right for what it was. Plus, I only had to work about five hours on the days where we had to do the removals. So, on the date in question, back around 2010... Our area had gotten a lot of snow and we had four properties we were supposed to do, which meant that we were going to be out until around eight removing the snow. We loaded up and got through the first three with relative ease. No real problems besides being cold as hell and dealing with a mild case of frostbite. We headed out to the final property, which was a bit of an uppity style property. By that, I mean it was a full-on rental property that was owned by a big real estate company, and it was a bunch of townhomes and duplexes around what was essentially its own block. The part that makes it uppity were the people, prices, and property requirements. The people were snooty, the prices were outrageous for the area, and the property management were the only people that we ever had problems with. For the most part, the properties we worked with had one requirement, make the snow not block the way of cars. This specific property, however, were super anal about where the snow went, the direction we plowed in, and the type of ice melt we used. Yes, they had a specific brand that they required we use because it was less harmful to the cement. We get the first half of the property done and cleared out, and when we get to the southeast corner, we noticed that there's already a pile of snow in one of the parking spots, like someone had used a small plow or a large shovel to move it into a pile about four feet or so tall, and they had filled the entire handicapped parking spot. We kind of sat there for a moment trying to figure out if we should call the office and tell them that one of their tenants had left a pile of snow shoveled in one of the spots, but I made a comment about how they would just blame us because it wasn't in the designated snow zone. My boss sighed and paused for a second, thinking about what we should do. The spot wasn't large enough for him to maneuver in, and there were cars next to it anyway, which meant we were going to have to get out and move the snow back into the parking lot so we could then move it to the correct area. This meant a lot of manual labor 
to move a pile of snow just to repile the snow elsewhere, which meant I was the one that had to get out there and do it. I hopped out of the truck and walked back to get the shovel, then went over to the pile of snow and attempted to push some of it off the top. And of course, it had become a chunk of ice, more than a pile of snow. I smacked it some with the shovel to loosen it up, but had to climb over it and start breaking chunks off, but I was getting nowhere fast. I motioned for my boss and our coworker to come over and help. They parked and grabbed the shovels and we started all chipping away at the parking lot iceberg. It took us a few minutes to get a good portion of it into the parking lot, but when we got most of the way through, I noticed that there was something in the snow pile. It didn't take long for all three of us to realize what we were looking at. It was an arm, and that arm was attached to a torso. This pile of snow that a tenant had packed so carefully into this parking spot wasn't done out of frustration of said tenant. This was a temporary grave. We immediately dropped the shovels and ran back to the truck. My boss grabbed the phone and called 911 to report it, and he told me to call the property management. The management showed up first, then the police and EMS, though EMS wasn't going to be able to do much. This person was quite obviously dead. They had us help remove the ice as best we could from around her so they could get her out and attempt to identify. As soon as we were able to get her uncovered, it was pretty clear how she died. There were multiple stab wounds to the chest and stomach area. The management was able to identify her right away. It was one of their elderly tenants that lived in the building that was just to the right of the parking spot. They told the police that she lived alone and that no one in the area had any problems with her or anything. We were pretty much told by management that our job was done there and the police thanked us for our help. We packed our stuff up and decided that we were done for the day. My boss said that he felt like we should take a day or two off because of how messed up the situation was. After a few days, when we all met back up, my boss had actually told us that he was able to contact the management of the property and talk with them about the situation, and they told him more about it. This older woman was a decent tenant, but she had apparently moved her son into her basement without the knowledge of management, and her son had a drug problem. It was basically a case of her wanting him to live with her and get better, but he was set in his ways, and apparently they had a disagreement that night, and he killed her, then buried her in the snow somewhere around 3 in the morning. If we had done our route backwards, as we sometimes did, and went to that property first thing, we probably would have run into him burying her. We all kind of guessed that he knew she would be found eventually and that it would be easier to just cover her in the snow as it was likely to not melt for a couple of weeks. Plus, he may have thought we would just pile more in the spot when we plowed it. He was caught, thankfully, because he had taken his mother's car and attempted to get it as far away as he could. Thankfully, he was the main suspect and they put out a call for the car so when it was spotted literally two towns over that same day, he was taken in and he told them about what he had done. I actually did this for a couple more years after this incident, but every time we approached a pile of snow that was more than a foot high, my boss and I kind of clenched, wondering if it was going to happen again. Thankfully, it never did. Hello friends, so that was a collection of winter stories. Now, winter is by far my favorite season, but if I had to experience any of these, that would ruin it for me. So hopefully the rest of you can enjoy something about winter and not have to experience something like this. But anyways, if you liked what you heard, feel free to hit that thumbs up button and if you want to hear more content like this, uh, consider subscribing. You can also leave me a comment below and tell me your thoughts and which story was your favorite. 
With that being said, friends, I hope you have a fantastic week. And until next time, take care.